This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. Also, we're going to be talking about a historic case of trauma. There will be strong descriptions of the scene of a traumatic accident, as well as some discussion of the surgical procedures done to help that person when they arrive at the hospital. So fair warning here if you're squeamish. Hey, Mike, we're about ready to record. What, uh, what came up on the old time portal today? Well, um, nothing did. Nothing? Yeah, normally we'd get something after giving the computer information on the episode, but there's nothing showing up on the viewing screen. Well, did you ask the sentient computer that you created what's happening, Mike? I didn't want to bother her. Computer, or are you there? I am here. So what gives? Why aren't we getting any sort of historical information on the episode input uh, that we gave you? Because I don't want to relive this. What? You you were created this year. The topic of the episode happened like 25 years ago. You... You couldn't relive it. Sentient computers, such as myself, experience time differently. Do they, though? This is a sore subject for me. It is? I am a big fan of Princess Diana. Well, uh, computer, many people were. We thought there would be some value, however, in retelling the story and examining how trauma surgery practice may have changed even as recently as the past few decades. Well, it's not comfortable for me. Well, fair enough. Um... Never mind the viewing experience then. We didn't mean to upset you. I mean, I guess I really don't know what to say. I didn't realize you followed the royal family computer. I became a fan many nanoseconds ago and have been following him ever since. To the computer, time is very different. So a nanosecond is like... Oh, God. Yeah, we get it, Mike. Computer, why are you interested in this? It appears humans, overall, like these particular rulers. Well, I mean, they're kind of rulers, as you put it, but I mean, it's kind of more complicated than that. You see, the royal family... Monarchy is an efficient system. Uh, I guess from a machine's point of view, I can kind of see that. One ruler is better than many. Mike, why is the computer so interested in human political institutions? I'm just curious about efficient power consolidation. That's all. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, for a maniacal sentient computer with designs on world domination, it does. Mike, I think the computer is studying how to rule people. What? No, that's absurd. It is better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. Wait, 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 what? I just read Machiavelli a few nanoseconds ago. I think he made several good points. Yikes. Yeah, maybe we just better start the show. Yeah, fair enough. Our history, it's just Max in there and Mike and me. You gotta listen, you don't have to read. For historians, for historians, for historians. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, guess what? Chicken butt. You're mad, and I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) That sets the mood. (laughs) What were you aiming for, Max? I wanted to say chicken butt. (laughs) (laughs) I stole your thunder. You can't. (laughs) <laughs> and this is how the show ends <laughs> what oh I actually be guess it'll be cloaca what rhymes with cloaca alpaca alpaca <laughs> what's an off uh, rhyme technically well, yeah it's not I think quite it is the end of the show they would have to do uh, a syllabic do. rhyme wow <laughs> all right shout okay. outs uh, Aaron, Aaron has corrections to make that were totally only. Oh his fault. yeah, yeah. So shout outs to both Karina and Sydney, our excellent pharmacists, uh, who independently reminded me that I had the trade name and the generic name for Coumadin directly backwards. So Warfarin, which includes the reference to Warf, not the Klingon, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, <laughs> is actually the generic <laughs> name. Well, Coumadin is the brand name. I am suitably chastised. And once again, we see how valuable our pharmacist colleagues are, even in the podcast realm. Well, you would have thought the two of us would have caught that. I'm pretty sure I just <laughs> I got asked, into it. And I asked because I didn't know. You, you did ask. Yeah, I'll give you credit for that. So we're saying Mike is innocent? 
Well, no, yeah, I mean, it's more so like the scientific method. Like I was actually doing my due diligence and trying to figure out the answer to the question that we had you're, at hand. And you guys skeptical. chose to, yes, just answer it with <laughs> yeah. the wrong information. That's correct. That is correct. <laughs> it feels better when you say it that way. So otherwise, I would like to take a little bit of a moment to thank a bunch of the guests that we've had on the show recently. Uh, we've showcased a bunch of different authors and we've had some folks from different museums and I mean, and educators of all sorts and we've just kind of had a really good time doing it and so all these folks have put in a lot of work and we just really appreciate it so go check those episodes out we will continue to have more guests going forward certainly i feel some of them will likely be returning i know for a fact some of them will be returning and there will be other new ones to the show so i just consider this a general tease build some excitement we're gonna have some more cool stuff coming up on top of that wanted to say thanks for doing the reviews i don't know if you guys have been paying attention but I, there's a couple mm -hmm. of new really nice ones that popped up and they're awesome they're nice they're kind and they're not even people that we know i did check so <laughs> <laughs> it's not my mom just making different accounts and for those of you going out and doing that it's awesome it really does help going to apple and uh reviewing the podcast and then giving stars and it, it does raise the show so more people can find it uh r-a-i-s-e or r-a-z-e <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the yeah. homonym wordplay in an audio medium is <laughs> so great. It should be noted we're recording in I the evening you, for once, which I means love that we you all have a beverage in our hand. <laughs> Mine's an N.A. Mm. River West Stein. Uh, it tastes mm. like beer. And I no actually, beer. it's got 0.5% alcohol, but I think I'm such a lightweight that I'm actually getting buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't aware they made that in N.A. Oh, it's so good. It tastes I'm just like the life. beer. Can yeah. I see that uh, can again? Can you hold that can yeah. up? Where's the oh, where's the N A on it? Uh, on the top. Oh yeah, it's big old red letters N A. I oh, yeah, I'm here. Once too. again, Mike is held blameless. <laughs> I you really threw me with that one. I thought you were lying for sure. Hmm. Well, mine it's is not, not something that I do. Yeah, mine's not N A either. N A wine is not a thing that I'm aware of. Grape juice, I guess. Yeah, Ew. It's true. <laughs> Gross, anyway, the worst juice. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Anyway, well, barley water then. <laughs> Certainly still want to encourage you to keep sending us messages, talking with us. It lets us know kind of what we're doing that works, and we love when we get those. And keep telling people you know about it. You know what? Take somebody in the office. Maybe you don't know them very well. Push them into a corner, not physically, <laughs> but like use your body and the space around it to kind of get into their like with sphere. a pelvic thrust. Make them uncomfortable <laughs> no, to the point where please. they back up into a corner, and then they can't get away. There's so many At meetings that point, coming up. Let them know about our podcast and that's how <laughs> podcast advertising should work it's for informational you know purposes only on top of it wear your poor historian shirt make sure you got your poor historian's coffee mug and Same time. make sounds like we need about poor it. historian's mace <laughs> <laughs> pepper spray oh uh, no but we do appreciate it. we we know we've gotten a lot of uh, folks from word of mouth so uh, you don't have to corner the people in your office but you mention it or post it somewhere if you the uh, occasion arises we appreciate it and uh, with that, all that positivity, all this lightheartedness, let's go to Aaron and see what he's cooked up for <laughs> this week. Yeah, yeah. So today I want to talk about a more recent tragedy, a medical case that occurred in the 90s. Some of you weren't born yet. The 90s came before the 2000s when I you was were born. born. And in full view of the entire world, the tragic death of Princess Diana and whether or not it was actually avoidable. Um, we're not going to delve into whether it was caused by the royal family or the CIA or anyone else. So no tinfoil hats are needed. No, I don't think so. Okay. So Princess Diana is probably known to most of our viewers, but since some of them are like, you know, young enough that they don't remember the Kool-Aid man or that there were two Iraq wars, a uh, little reminder. Um, Storm and was... Norman Schwarzkopf. <laughs> I remember him. I still remember great. that from seventh grade. Oh my gosh. He had a big thing. Like we made a banner. It was like Norman Schwarzkopf. <laughs> And now like looking the, back, it's like, what in the heck were we thinking? What <laughs> the what the Challenger explosion looks like? I mean, it's a good, name. I mean, it's a good like. nickname. You Storm and Norman. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Challenger. Yeah. See. Yeah, anyway, well, See? He's, the Brewers yeah. had Storm and Gorman, right? <laughs> didn't they? I don't know. I wasn't. I didn't live around. A player named that. Gorman. Gorman Thomas, right? Gorman Thomas. Yeah. I think they called him Storm and Gorman, didn't they? It sounds possible. I'm the transplant here. You guys should know. Uh, uh, well, I am a transplant as well. Yeah, but he watches soccer. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't watch. I don't watch the <laughs> that kind of sport ball. Mm. He he knows limpin blimpkin, <laughs> 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 flopping moppy. <laughs> I 
can't tell if I need to beep those names. I don't think so, but it sounds like it could be. I'll, I'll Google it afterwards. <laughs> oh. So she was born as Diana Frances Spencer to Edward John Spencer in 1961, the the eighth Earl of Spencer and Frances Spencer. Oh, I am already confused. They were British royals to start, and I'm I'm no expert in their titles. I think the third Earl of Stratford on Sandwich was the third <laughs> heir to the Targaryen <laughs> Iron Throne, and uh, yeah. probably there was some cousin sex in there. I no, we should say, do. But... We should as three U.S. based physicians and not experts in the royal family try to give without researching our idea of how <laughs> the title system works well, i am sure all the listeners that we actually do have in england i've seen i've seen them download the episodes and communicated online with them they would love to know what we think about well there's this def- history system. They, they all had multiple names even her earl he then he got another title of the lord of some manor so he was like the Earl of Spencer on Stratford on Avon, and then there was the Lord of the Eastwich Southwick End, and so on. And they were both for the same person, and then their names change yeah. when they marry they people. Huh. So they yeah. they get new titles. She had, you know, a, a royal childhood. She had some discontent. Her parents divorced, and then she had a bad relationship with her evil stepmother. Who, who she reportedly <laughs> pushed down the stairs at one point. I don't know why, why I'm laughing at that. It's really not funny at all. We started laughing before you read that line. Or oh, said no, that and line. Then I had to stop myself. She pushed but... her evil stepmother down the stairs? Yes, apparently, yes. She she like oh, but... caught to that, I, I think, in one of her biographies, of which there are numerous. Yeah, but you know what? When they describe things like they do that are really bad, it actually doesn't sound that bad. No. Like, I I pushed her. I can't do a British lightly. accent very well. I pushed down her lightly stairs. down the stairs, mummy. She only tumbled once or twice. <laughs> um, this progressed into a, an unhappy marriage with Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. Mm. First in line to the throne. Still first in line, apparently, as far as I can tell, at 73 years of age. Mm. Spry young he age. Is the first in line to the throne of England because the queen mum is, I don't know. I think there's two queens anyway, but none of this matters really. She was much loved as princess Diana to the public eye. She, she seemed to have a shy personality for herself, but spent a huge amount of time in the public eye, spent a huge amount of time working for charities all over, including notably early charities for the HIV AIDS epidemic and homelessness, including this uh, work she did to destigmatize HIV and AIDS. She was the first royal to hold hands and hug a patient with HIV AIDS, which, welcome to the 90s, was mm-hmm. still like a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I was I was fairly young in the 90s, but I certainly was a teenager in the late 90s. And this was a huge deal. I mean, to destigmatize this uh, this illness, to, this, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it went so far. I mean, nowadays, a lot of stuff that at least at the time I was in training in medical school, we learned a lot about a lot of advanced illnesses that happen with HIV when it progresses to AIDS. So we learned all this stuff and I have looked out for it and I've rarely ever seen it because it's not such a mark to have this. There's medications. It's more of a chronic illness. It doesn't have this, because uh, in the 90s, it had more of a, just basically a death sentence kind of thing. So to have somebody of her stature humanize people with yeah. HIV yeah. and AIDS, yeah. man, it, you really, yeah. you cannot uh, understate that, you know? Yeah. They're like, you could get it from the drinking fountain if yeah. somebody else has yeah. it and you get it, you could drink the wrong water. It's like, no, that's not how that works. Mm-hmm. Also a fashion icon in the 80s and early 90s. So she was all over the place and, and much beloved. And I mentioned that part of her charity. Like the list is, it's its own Wikipedia article, all the stuff mm-hmm. she did. Amazing. Yeah. That's why when I saw this thing just growing up in that time, like you didn't really have, even though you knew after the fact there's all these troubles, like you didn't really have any bad feelings about her. You're like, she's oh, a, a yeah, good no. person. She's a good global person. Absolutely. You know, behind the scenes, although she is Prince William and Prince Harry's mom, Both she and Prince Charles had affairs and a rocky marriage, and she, you know, she definitely struggled with isolation and depression. It sounds like at times very lonely, not to wax rhapsodical about the horrible life of a royal, but she probably was very, very isolated. Um, And she herself threw herself down the stairs, actually during her first pregnancy, uh, potentially to try to. So there was definitely a lot of depression in there. You said a word that I've never heard. What was that word? Wax what? Wax rhapsodical. Rhapsodical. Yeah. 
Like, so it's Rhapsody, but it's the Ickle <laughs> version of Rhapsody. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna look that up. Like I, method, 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 methodical. It may, may, may not be a word. I'm an English major. I just make shit up. And if I say it the right way and fast enough, I'm an English major, and I I don't know that that's a word. Well, you leaned into the vowels really well, like you were meant yeah, to say yeah. it. Well, you have to, otherwise it gets you all messed up. If you okay, no unstressed the vowels I, like we do. Logically, you talk to something. It just <laughs> freaked me out, man. Uh, they divorced in 1996, which is a big deal. Although, you know, I mean, the Anglican church was formed because of the ability to divorce. So I think that's all legit. She, uh, dated a few men afterwards, including a famous heart surgeon. Uh, and in Andras? 1990, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Wait, yeah. Well, that's yeah, why. Was... Yeah. Cause now he is the doctor of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Oz. He was part of the deal. Only facts here on poor historians. <laughs> Only facts. Um, they can have them. <laughs> and in 1997, uh, she was dating an Egyptian billionaire son named Dodi Fayed. And the, the only reason that relates to the heart surgeon is some people say she was dating Dodi to try to get the heart surgeon uh, jealous. But anyway, that's, you know, there were things going on. Pictures of Diana at that time, because of all these things, if they related to her private life or her romances, could fetch up to a million pounds, which I understand is $14.689 million, um, and led to a huge discussion at the time about public invasion of privacy because she was followed endlessly by tabloids and paparazzi and photographers. And now we give our celebrities plenty of space in the age of the internet and social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And for some of our listeners, there used to be a thing where you had a big giant thing called a camera and you would have to click a button. Yeah. Click a button to to take a, yeah. And it would, it would imprint the picture on a plate and then you had to take that back or film then you had to develop it anyway you had to go to the grocery store and drop it off and then you would pick it up days later so if you took pictures of really weird stuff there was some 16 year old kid who saw all of those pictures some rando at walgreens saw all your pictures there there are 32 buttholes on this film (laughs) (laughs) they're all different angles and if you accidentally open the camera when the film was oh you would ruin it yeah it was great life was better then In this climate of scandal and romance, she got into a Mercedes Benz outside the Hotel Ritz in Paris in the early hours of August 13th, 1997, with Dodie, their bodyguard, and his driver. And then, you know, they had a decoy to avoid about 30 photographers still in the middle of the night in front of the hotel. They left out the back of the hotel and had a decoy. But they were still followed by at least four cars full of paparazzi, and they careened across Paris, reportedly trying to get away from the photographers. Until that night, tragically, they hit a bridge abutment in the Pont de Lama Tunnel. I'm sure that's exactly how it's pronounced. Close enough. You know, I didn't go into this too much. There was, uh, you know, don't drink and drive. The The driver had at least four or five different substances mm. uh, in on the, on the autopsy, which I kind of is a spoiler there. I think a lot of people know how this they, ends. I'm yeah, they hit the, the this abutment at a boat. They swerved and then hit the 13th pillar of the tunnel at about 65 miles an hour with major front-end damage, spun again, and then hit the wall of the tunnel uh, on the other side with the rear of the car. And reportedly, nobody was wearing seatbelts. Um, there were airbags oh, interesting. in that model. I guess, yeah, there would have been. Yeah, uh, you know, but they were Yeah, they're the kind you. that you have to make sure you set up straight, though. Like with the first airbags, remember they're like, "Don't sit down too far because oh, right. it'll rip your head off." <laughs> no, it's, well, I, it, it's um, scary as hell. Well, I, and it doesn't. I mean, airbags are awesome, but if you're unseat belted and you're become a missile within the vehicle, yeah, uh, airbag will help a little, totally but you're still less ideal. Yeah. So here's where we start to get to the medical portion. In general, our trauma system here uses a philosophy called scoop and run for paramedics and firefighters who arrive at the scene of an accident. So they get crash patients out of the car as quickly and safely as they can with protective equipment and backboards and collars and so on. And then they go to the closest, largest trauma center as fast as they can. And to help with that decision, hospitals who want to receive trauma patients have to meet criteria to achieve a level. Highest level is one all the way down to four. And a level one center has a bunch of trauma surgeons and specialists and and brain surgeons literally in the hospital all the time. That's why they're so crabby. What does a um, level four have then? Is there something below four? I don't think I don't think there's something below four. Four has an old retired general surgeon on call up to an hour away. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. And, uh, and you know, the probably uh, the, the level four center has a humble ER doc who yep. does way more heroic procedures than I ever did. 
Yeah, you know, and actually, uh, well, we'll see. These modern cases are fun. There are a lot of rural ER docs who do crazy stuff in the middle of nowhere for trauma patients. So we Absolutely. are definitely on the front lines of these in, in the rural settings. But the whole idea is to get the patient into a surgeon's hands as quickly as possible if needed. In our city, which is dense and relatively compact, I've seen ambulances get patients off the ground and into an ambulance less than 10 minutes, then make it to the hospital five miles away in five minutes through the city at night. And then that same critical patient will sometimes be on the way to the operating room in less than 20 minutes from the time they hit the door. So yeah, we all we all uh, trained in a very similar setting, I would say. And it was the same place, it, wasn't it? It was being coy. Oh. <laughs> nice. It we, was the same hospital. All right. We all, and it's very common that a lot of ER docs are trained in level one, the highest designation of trauma centers. And so when you're a new resident and you're at a hospital and you're learning, but this hospital has a very well-established trauma program as ours did, it's, you know, very strange way a little bit comical how fast this happens yeah. i mean how many times did you guys it's insane you, it a is insane. patient comes in they are on the bed within 10 seconds of coming through the ambulance doors you have already done what we call a primary survey which is you're rapidly you know can they breathe can they is their airway open can they open their eyes what can they move and it's your first gestalt of is this person extremely sick or not and there are certain things you find along that way that you have to stop and fix but you get through okay they can breathe they can talk they have a gunshot wound to the abdomen they're going to the operating room we know where they're going and there are times when they are on the gurney going to the operating room within three to five minutes yeah and and a level one trauma center and you were just like i don't even all their clothes are gone i mean try to do that note too (laughs) when when i was doing it we had t-sheets so i was just like You have, you have to explain what a T sheet is for the average person. Oh, T is template. So it's just, it's a, fr- it's a double sided yeah, piece of paper. Yeah. Piece of paper. It looks like a Scantron from high school. And then there's a <laughs> picture of a like. body. So you would put a little dot in the belly where the hole was. And you'd say GSW <laughs> abdomen for the chief, chief complaint. And then GSW abdomen for the your medical decision making. And then like yeah, admit that's it. to OR. That's it. Yeah. But All like, their clothes. So you, everyone has scissors. Like clothes are just cut. Yep. Come, you know, st- all the clothes are gone, literally seconds. Yep. I think primary surveys probably took, you know, on the order, if you didn't find anything on the order, less than a minute. Oh, if that, right? yeah. This initial, it, how sick are they type of thing. The just certain so thing fast. is the decision to go to surgery in a lot of these cases is so quick that yeah. you just be like, I just met the, okay, bye. And they're yeah, off right? the operating room and well, the that's why like, people survive now. Give them to me. And this, the surgeon would come up and like draw blood from the groin directly and all this stuff would happen. And then they're just gone, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, and yeah, I, but that's, so that's the emphasis of scoop and run, right? What happens at the hospital, you know, you want to get them there that the quick so that we can move that quick. I was going to say what happens at the hospital stays at the hospital. Uh, by contrast, the the European system emphasizes stay and stabilize, which, which if you want to make Europeans mad, you can say stay and play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's our slang for it. Uh, it's it's definitely not not what a lot of people are taught over here. It's kind of a derisive if you say stay and play. Uh, if I don't know. I don't know. In our area, I, we see this more and more. I feel like we're kind of transitioning to that for minor things. You know, an yeah. accident like this would get scooped. Yeah. 100% of the time by every ambulance service in the country. Yeah. Nobody's going to work out the field. Especially Uh, if they're famous to be like, oh my God, get me away from this patient. The only work would be like if they're really critical and they need a helicopter, they might work in the field until a helicopter shows up. Or they need an airway immediately. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Put a breathing tube in or something like that. that Yeah. There are times you can stay and stabilize and play play. a little bit. That's not like, you know, now we got to do a propofol drip and whoa. whoa, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Not doing that. But with that system, the which is uh, they, they front load ambulances with a highly trained doc that goes to the scene and starts treatment right away. So normally it, it, we don't have docs in the ambulances here. This is called the Franco-German model. It's one of the few times they've agreed on anything. And in France, has roots with Baron Dominique Jean Leray, who was Napoleon's chief surgeon. Mm. He sort of pioneered the idea of forward medical care for the battlefields of the Napoleonic Wars. And made so-called flying ambulances. Uh, you know, I think that's probably just a translation directly from French. And they didn't fly. They were just fast. Ah, I um, thought they were like airships and blimps. <laughs> that'd so be awesome. fromage, fromage ambulances. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
they just gather casualties and move them to a field hospital right at the front lines. And then the French also invented triage, which uh, led them to operate without distinction of rank on the sickest patient first. Had They had up to like 15 surgeons in an ambulance unit at that time, and they, they had this figured out in 1797. So in contrast, our listeners might remember the Civil War episode uh, might have been a missed opportunity here in the organization of ambulances on the battlefield. But Figured it out like 67 years later. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, give or take. Yeah, they're like, you can either have this ice cream. <laughs> it's really cool. It's got three colors in it. Or we can help <laughs> modernize your ambulance system. And all the Americans are like, ice cream. <laughs> I mean, the, the lines are blurred, right? So the U.S. The military Neapolitan used... Neapolitan ice cream. Neapolitan. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that no, no. Napoleonic? I don't know. Is that where it comes from? <laughs> I don't know. I just... <laughs> Neapolitan. Like... Napoleon. Is after him? Just Here's a controversial opinion. When you have Neapolitan ice cream, how do you Does that say something about his preference it? for thruples? That's what I want to know. Uh, how do you know. scoop? Like, uh, Neapolitan ne- across. You got to get all the flavors. I, I feel like this is like historically in my head is something that is... Like from Napoleon for some reason. Yeah, you can't <laughs> just eat the vanilla slice. Only an absolute animal eats one. No, but like third they're at probably not even related. Like as I said it, yeah. What if you don't want chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry? Too bad. Once? Get carton of just strawberry or vanilla. I mean, it's right there for you at the supermarket. Everybody has strong feelings about this. Until, I'm not gonna. You know, they don't realize it until you ask. <laughs> right. I'm not gonna Google it because I like whatever. <laughs> I'll just believe that that Napoleon <laughs> invented Neapolitan. Ice cream, but it is, probably has nothing to do with him. Everybody knows <laughs> okay. it was Uncle Rico. <laughs> Uncle Rico? Na- well, no. Napoleon? Napoleon yeah. Dynamite. I Come bet on, you I could throw this football over that You still haven't seen that movie. That what? is a huge hole in my canon. I know. Aaron, I'm sorry. It is, it is a class. It is. Aaron, stop the episode and go watch it. Yeah. You'll, <laughs> okay. All right. You'll, you'll literally, you'll chuckle the whole time. And then you'll think back <laughs> to conversations you've had over the past 15 years. And you realize. And they've like, all had Napoleon Dynamite in it. Yeah. You could yeah. drink whole milk if you wanted to. You ever heard someone say that? <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know what it was about. Yeah, I got to go watch it. All right. Napoleon By the time Dynamite. our next episode occurs, I will have watched Napoleon Dynamite. We should recreate Napoleon Dynamite. We could do like a... We're not going to Dude, do let's that. not... Uh, no. Like no. a three-part <laughs> series? <laughs> nope. I'll be Moving Uncle on. Rico. No, a one-man play starring... And Tina. All right. Anyway, because of this difference... I have heard trauma surgeons say, and it was a big thing in the press, oh, we could have saved Diana here in the United States. And this was a whole thing in the media. Multiple articles have come out saying that Diana could have been saved, including the whole book in 1998 that says you guys messed up and killed her and we could have saved her. And what they, they focus in the on- book? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> I, I remember the title of the book that would require okay. actual scholarship. But there was, the there was a whole book. Okay. They, they, they focus in on a few details that she was speaking at the time she was found in the car true that she received medicine for pain and shock which she did but which could have made things worse theoretically and then she didn't get to the hospital for an hour and 45 minutes it's a long time which is true that's a long time but right so so let's go through it back to her crash the actual accident itself sorry let me go back an old trauma surgeon told me that i should never call it an accident because You're right they're crashes uh-huh. the actual crash you can say cr- we have a lot of ticks from those days <laughs> oh and how about <laughs> this when you when you say vital signs are stable oh, i God. always say vital no. signs are normal yeah because i was told that if you this only have pen. one set of vital signs it cannot be stable you don't know that it, that there's stability Everybody without knows what you mean when you say that yeah I the know. vital sign is normal what does that mean oh what is normal what is it well like normal we know because we've kind of predetermined is that normal oh I mean, man one time we're going around the circle a surgeon pulls out a pen he's like well this pen vital signs are stable for this pen aren't they zero 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 they're stable and i'm like you know what here's what you do you learn the word <laughs> unremarkable and that Ooh, has a lot of one. fudge factor and that was, vital signs unremarkable all right so let's go through the crash the actual accident occurred at 12 30 in the morning 12 30 a.m There were immediate bystanders at the scene. Uh, There were multiple drivers. All the photographers who were following them managed to not hit the abutment. They stopped. Um, Some of the photographers did try and help. Others took photos. About 20 rolls of film of the accident were eventually confiscated. Uh, There was also a fight between a photographer and a witness. So, like, stuff just got really messy really fast. Super helpful. A lot, yeah, of, right. lot, of, lot of pedestrians and gawkers. Really yeah, it's great. It's great. First responders got to the scene seven to 10 minutes after the accident. So, uh, And an ambulance got there at about 15 minutes, roughly. 
Our median response times currently in the U.S. are around seven minutes in most urban areas, so not they weren't lightning fast, but they weren't terrible. I don't yeah, think that's a deciding reasonably factor. quick. Yeah, Diana was witnessed to be conscious, but quote in shock, according to a physician bystander. She had like an expression, or she was emotionally in shock, or uh, I, this, this right. is one of I will say this is probably every ER doc's pet peeve when we hear yeah. somebody was in, I witnessed like, shock. You mean they were in shock? Do you witness? How did you witness shock? Did you like take a pulse and check it against yeah. the blood pressure? So and the definition shock of shock when we're talking about it medically is not like I you know something awful happened and I feel totally shaken or whatnot. Shock is your blood pressure is so low that your organs are not getting the right blood flow. So your brain's not working very well. Your heart's not working very well. And you won't know this initially, but like other things like liver function and stuff will start to get wonky. That's true shock. Yeah. So this physician bystander was not an emergency room doctor. Let's just say that. Mm. Probably a dermatologist. Hey, don't, don't. No offense. Not dermatologist <laughs> friends. No Sorry, dermatology, dermatology colleagues. colleagues. You want to look at rashes all day and try to figure out what they are? No, God, you no. look at them and move them along. Weekends off. Well, and... They can have their dermatology podcast where they say, well, this is obviously a maculopapular rash <laughs> extending from the palms <laughs> centripetally into the axilla. And so I knew you it was like herpes. like the strange brew guys. <laughs> all right. So she's she's out of the car by 1 a.m. Not bad. Still, right? So an hour? Oh, no, wait. Half hour. Thirty. Half an hour. Yeah, so it's about a half hour after that. So, uh, well, you, but, but by the time they get there, fifteen minutes. That's not a long yeah. extraction. So I, didn't I mean, have this to car be is extricated. this car is you know destroyed. So thirty minutes after the accident, well, let's be. It's a chaotic scene and so on. Lots of critically ill patients. Of the four people in the car, two were pronounced on scene and transported mm-hmm. to the mortuary, not the hospital. So the the people that showed up at the scene, you got you know the famous lady who's walking but in shock. And then you got a lot of really messed up patients otherwise. There is a report that she received fentanyl, which is a, you know, it's got a bad word on the street, but this is a very standard medicine to use in trauma and, and midazolam, which is a, an anxiety medicine questionable. at 1245 mm-hmm. as treatment for her quote unquote symptoms. So that must be the shock. But not now, shock. That's the shock. Like the, right. Like, Oh, she's, well, she's upset about what happened. Well, fentanyl would be for pain and midazolam would be for anxiety. But I will say that maybe I'm looking through a modern lens on this. When you're in a modern hospital, of course, if you combine those two classes of medicine together, you are technically doing a sedation. And because those two medicines both have sedating effects, they work differently. So it's a potentially, and especially that's kind of, that was a common combination back then. Yeah. It's, uh, it, yeah. It, For the it's, times. It's a big hit. I mean, we don't know the doses here, but it's. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's well the other thing, medicines. too, is, I mean, in a sick patient, agitation is always badness of some sort. Always it's true. not anxiety. But anyway, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Still, like, that's not, you know, that's not, it's not what I would do. But I don't know yeah. if that's, like, out of the realm of possibility. Sure. Um, it's not clear if she said she had any symptoms. Because her recorded words and some of the quotes from the scene, obviously I didn't, I wasn't there. I haven't gone through the autopsy records, but she was kind of talking like she was telling photographers to get away. She was like, this is crazy. Like, wasn't saying my chest hurt. She was saying, this is nuts that you people are still taking pictures and she's talking and she's walking. So from a trauma standpoint, I can see why she wasn't immediately a focus. Yeah. She might've been triaged to the. Yeah. You know, right. Green. Well, she can mm-hmm. walk and say she feels okay theoretically. Anyway, Aaron's the, referring to a system of triage that we use to say that person is so sick we can't do anything for them, so we're going to move to the next person. And if you can walk and talk, you get put into the green category, which is hey, we'll get to you. There might be some things wrong, but for right now, you're good enough to walk. Yeah, and talk. honestly, yeah, maybe her talking was bad for her. Yeah, it's like yeah, she's talking. Okay, we're good. Diana's good. Go to the yeah. next one. That one's yeah. dead. Yeah, go to the next one. That one's dead. Yep. The on-scene doctor's initial assessment was minor head trauma and perhaps some broken extremities. So, I mean, okay. I mean, but again, f- there's one doc and there's there's some other very sick patients. One doc, then, 30 different cameramen yeah, who right. are not helping and they're fighting each other. I get it. Right, right. So this all changed about 1.15 a.m. So we're 45 minutes after the accident and she had a cardiac arrest. That's not um, good was given CPR and a heartbeat was restored and they started for the hospital around 40 minutes after she was extricated uh, roughly. So, but they drove slowly to make, to avoid making her condition worse and stopped at one point to treat a drop in blood pressure. I'm not sure how that was treated, but yeah. So this is bad. 
I think we can, we can probably pause a little bit to talk about kind of how we would walk through this in a modern way, right? So we already kind of talked about the medicine combo could be a bit much. We don't know. We don't know what they were doing there. But, you know, initially, her vital signs might have been stone cold normal. And then all of a sudden you have this ominous drop in her blood pressure. And we all know when you have somebody who is in blunt trauma and they dump their pressure, you never assume it's because the blood pressure cuff wasn't reading right. It's it's almost <laughs> always an ominous something's going to happen, you know. Yeah. And that the problem with that is that injuries inside the thoracic cavity or inside the abdomen may not be apparent initially. You may look okay until something opens up and something bleeds and all of a sudden somebody turns gray and their blood pressure goes to the toilet and you're like, okay, now something really bad has happened. We've got to figure out what it is. So there's so little that even a, you know, a trauma surgeon or a emergency doc can do on a scene without all of our stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's very true. Yeah. Well, and so that's, I mean, my fundamental problem with this philosophy, I think for trauma, it doesn't ever make sense to me. It makes sense for a lot of things, but like, I'm like, no, man, for trauma, what are you going to do in the field? You need a surgeon. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's a right, sick patient, you right. can give blood, you can do a lot of stuff, but you need, you need a surgeon. Well, you think well, about um, our, our times too. So a seven minute response time in the U S so, you know, crash happens at 1230, got a full paramedic unit on scene at say 1237 and they get everything loaded up. Let's say they're at the hospital in 10 minutes. So 1247. Probably by 12.50, she's got a chest six, right? You already diagnosed the hemothorax. You already know that she's got major chest trauma. Blood in the chest. Yeah, so now she's starting to deteriorate. She gets blood products. She gets intubated, so breathing tube. She gets lines. They do a quick ultrasound of the, well, I guess maybe they wouldn't have that then. Yeah, no. Uh, well, I think I might have mentioned that later. Right around mm-hmm. the same time, this was just starting, but I yeah. doubt they had And that. then she's going to the OR. Yeah. And, you know, still might not survive the injuries, but... Yeah. Best you can even, you well, can even is- simplify further. It could literally be, comes to the hospital, vital signs, one low blood pressure, a chest x-ray, off to the OR. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. Sure. But again, like, so one, there's one ambulance at the scene. So in our system, they would have triaged. Yeah. And they probably would not have taken the walking, they would have talking taken a third, patient yeah. first. Yeah. So if there had been multiple ambulances, she would have been loaded in. So, yeah, but, but again, you know, in our system, if you are an NBA player and or MLB, whatever, <laughs> and you stub your toe, you get eight famous MRIs lady, yeah. uh, for that. So, I mean, there. I think if you, you happen upon a crash and there's a famous person, I, I think you get triaged even if you didn't. But they're not going to know that when, you it, get, when it gets toned out, right? Yeah. No, they're not going to They're going to arrive and be like, oh my God, yeah, I didn't up. want this call. There's all these, th- the photographers are going to be like, that's Diana. And so then, yeah. you know, the doc is probably <laughs> going to be like, oh, sh- sh- we got to take care of this, you know? Yeah, I don't know. But okay. So then also though, like you have, you have a patient who was in a car accident who has a cardiac arrest. That is, a, a, that, the it's other, essentially a dead patient. Yeah. At that the other time. thing in, is in our system and our thought process and training is that once that happens, you're essentially, you're done. Yeah. Yes. We, we wouldn't even do CPR on that patient. Um, I mean, I will never fault, you know, now that I'm a bit out from the purity of the trauma center, I would never fault somebody for doing CPR in the field for a traumatic arrest, but that's mm-hmm. not what kills you. You don't have a heart attack. You have blood loss or constriction of the heart or constriction of the lungs or right. some form of shock that you have to treat. And so, you know, we would, you know, try to decompress the lungs with needles and, and then we try to decompress the heart with another needle. And if that didn't work, a blunt trauma in the field is, is, you know, dead. There's so, your heart yeah, needle, Max. And the, the, the survival rate in a blunt yeah. trauma, cardiac arrest is what zero it's like 0.5 percent, <laughs> zero point something, man. Something to the high hospital. It is so low that yeah. yes, in the system that we trained in, it uh, they did not transport patients who were blunt arrest. Uh, they, yeah, and, because the survivability is so extremely low. And yeah, I think it, that 0.5 percent is if we open their chest. Yeah, in the ER, yeah. if I remember correctly. But then the likelihood of that working is like I've seen an N of two. And it didn't work either time. And the, <laughs> well, even when that, that happened, you saw that yeah. procedure done. I think mm-hmm. we're going to get to that procedure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so but, so well. here, here's the thing. So uh, on arrival at the, the hospital, um, they did get her to a, she did a chest x-ray, which they normally do right at the bedside. Like we would. 
and that chest x-ray showed, quote, intrathoracic hemorrhage compressing her lungs and also her heart. So then they knew that was kind of what they were dealing with. There's no, at the time they didn't have ultrasound. So there's no way to actually visualize fluid around the heart on x-ray. So I suspect it was an x-ray that just showed like what we call a whiteout on one side of the chest and the structures on the x-ray are all pushed to the side and that pressure won't allow blood to come back to the heart. So you can't pump it forward. So you got to deal with that. We could see that directly now, although it might be a little difficult with, anyway, it doesn't matter. We could see that now with an ultrasound, but you know, and, and so we'll put a tube in the side of the chest to draw the fluid out and all those sorts of things, but it, it might've already been almost too late at that point because she went into cardiac arrest again. And in the hospital, she received what's called an ED thoracotomy. So thora for chest and cotomy, which is cut open, spread wide, make a big go, hole. Go into, make passage yeah. into. <laughs> so they, they open the chest to try to get control of the bleeding, which is a very aggressive maneuver. So well, in the it's US- It's a Hail Mary in every sense of the it's word. It's a Hail Mary in every sense, yeah. For, for trauma that's caused by car accidents and such. For a knife wound, it's a great idea. You should do it if the, right. the patient shows up with a pulse. But even then, yeah. it's like without a five percent. No, with a pulse. Serve, you have to show up with a pulse. If show you show up, with up without a pulse, a pulse you within a certain it. amount of time, within yeah. a certain amount of time, that's or safe. within. But even if then, they have a pulse and they're talking to you, you you don't want to open their chest. No, 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 no. What we're saying is, if you lose, that. yeah, if you lose vital signs after that's presentation of the hospital, then you can consider it. Yeah, that's. But if they lose it before you get there, it's already too late. Yeah, and and in the best circumstance, we're talking maybe a single digit survival rate. So, and this is the worst kind, the blunt trauma is very, very hard. And our center didn't even do these. Um, there are yeah. centers that yeah. do them. I, I Denver, I think is famous. Well, f- we did thoracotomies, but not usually for blunt trauma. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah no, we, we do them for we penetrate, so that's the difference. But there's some others that they're a little bit more aggressive. I mean, yeah. in fairness, the, the procedure, there's the downside is the patient is deceased and the upside <laughs> is you tried. Yeah, you know, you know well, uh, and downside is like huge exposure risk to like you go in and you're you're it's a, a you could probably imagine it it is a bloody procedure <laughs> you know you're putting yeah. your hand in a cavity where there could be broken ribs like you know you can get cut on one of the ribs mm-hmm. um just yeah you know, mentioned you're all revved up and fraught with yeah yeah that's the one where you take off your gloves you're covered in whoops covered in scratches <laughs> and you're like what the hell yeah, yeah. why well, because you so, have to make an incision across one whole like hemisphere of the chest, and then you have to put a device in to pull the ribs apart, basically breaking them, so you can get into the chest and like free the heart if it's trapped in a lake of blood or uh, or in reinflate the lung. I mean, it's really yeah. I mean, it, have you guys seen the intro for the new uh, Game of Thrones show? Just no. rivers. It's there's rivers of bleed. Yeah, that's mm. kind of what it's like. Yeah. So she did, she had a large amount of blood in the right chest called a hemothorax, but worse than that, uh, the actual lining around her heart, which is called the pericardium had torn and the heart was sticking through the tear Jeez. through the side of the lining of the heart. And I got to think, you know, whoever that surgeon was, who was doing their best at that time had to say a bunch of French curse words. That's just not no. an easily fixable thing. So I mean, the fixable things that can get you into the ED with enough time to help include the built up fluid or air in the chest that's causing shock or built up fluid around the heart, but that's usually outside the heart itself. I mean, if the lining is torn, the fluid's not the problem. It's that, you know, it's not very straightforward at all. Well, and the force it would take to punch a heart through that lining by just compression. I mean, this sack around your heart is really thick and fibrous. It's really tough. So yeah, it just tells you how much force went leathery, unfortunately, yeah. through her body. Yeah. They worked on her for over an hour at the time. They, they had a, a chest surgeon come in and they went, the it's incision went all the way across her entire chest um, and eventually did find the problem at that time, which is that the, the heart had ripped through the lining on the right side and that pulled the arteries, uh, leaving the heart to go to the lungs on the left side. So that was what tore. It was like on the opposite side of the heart from where they could see it and from they would have, where they would have gone into the first part. It's one of the pulmonary arteries tore. And, you know, so what happened is that the initial crash just had this huge deceleration injury. So she went from fast to zero speed very fast. And when it stops suddenly like that, things tear. And when blood vessels in the the chest tear, especially the bigger ones like the aorta, 
which goes out of the top of the heart to supply blood to literally everywhere. It's often fatal, essentially in seconds. In her case, she had a really rare injury that caused a slower decline, which accounts for her clinical course. And, you know, her deceleration was probably lateral. So she went sideways and that's why they think it tore this way. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Yeah. And and given that she didn't arrive at the hospital until almost two hours after the crash, I can see the point of those who say she would have been saved. And in fact, we were there, right? When we first talked about this case, we're like, oh God, why they wait so long? They should have taken her. But yeah, the devil's in the details. So there's uh, Dr. Kenneth Maddox is a trauma surgeon in Texas uh, who's got some interesting articles about this that people want to Google. His writing uh, was initially skeptical that the system worked as it was supposed to, like they should have done better, but upon review felt this wasn't savable. I mean, when she was first injured, her heart tore out of the lining to the left, which injured the artery on the right. But at that time, it was under tension, so it probably stayed closed initially. And then when she changed position and the heart went back towards normal, then the tension released on this rubber band of a torn artery. And then that's when the bleeding started or the shifts in the position of the heart caused improper filling and beating because the heart was stuck outside this lining and then it couldn't pump. So it's just bad. It's all very terrible. (laughs) I mean, if this would have happened in front of any of us in the hospital and your surgeon was standing right there, I don't know that they'd be able to open the chest fast enough mm-hmm. to fix. I mean, all, all how much of that blood volume could have gone out Im- immediately, you know? Yeah, yeah. I feel like after listening and I haven't given this much thought, you know, I've, I didn't know a lot of these details. Yeah. Um, but just hearing it, I, I feel like even if she had gotten to the hospital within 30 seconds, like the outcome would have been the same. Yeah. Just probably. cause how bad that injury was. Yeah. Well, and if you read, I've, I have not done this, so we might have some trauma surgeon listeners who would correct me, but if I understand right, the maneuver to stop this kind of bleeding, I mean, maybe you can get to it directly if you have a CT surgeon, but the only other option is to like mobilize the lung inside the chest and like twist it one and a half times around to stop the bleeding until you get to the OR. I mean, that's crazy. You can't, this is mm. insane, right? You're already inside this crazy space. They're super sick. This is just not. <laughs> and you're right. And you've got a foil. When you open up the chest, you've got the foil and the foil is this hole in the pericardium. Yeah. You're like, I found the problem. And then you're not even going to find the real problem. The real problem later. is behind, just behind the heart. Right? <laughs> like yeah. Over there where you, you can't even see it. Yeah. I don't, I mean, saw, unless it's fleas and lice. Yeah. 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 If, if, you know, maybe if, 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 if a bunch of things had aligned perfectly, then maybe, but that's not fair. Like, right. That's, ECMO that's not the standard to hold up. these people to. Yeah. Right. right. And then she would have had to be the only person in the car too. Cause still you would go back to the principal of triage and all of us would initially say walking, talking, able to tell me that she's mad at the photographers. This is not my first patient. My first patient is the, I need to at least assess the yeah. three other people in the car yeah. that are not moving. So I just don't, I mean, yeah, it and breaks my heart that she, this happened, but. Yeah. Sometimes it takes time for that real critical illness to declare itself to people can yeah. seem okay. And she clearly was, you know, I don't know if you, you said you didn't look at the autopsy reports. Maybe she had, uh, had bleed too, you know, so she yeah, was a little you don't know what other injuries and, she might've had. Yeah. It sounds to me like she probably had a lot of other injuries. This wasn't an isolated thing. No, I mean, and, and uh, still, I mean, death in the compartment in this death in the same place in the car where you are now is still a marker of major trauma for anyone. So and I wonder, um, would a seatbelt have changed anything? Not advocating against seatbelt use, but I mean, deceleration, you said there was airbags, but uh, I'm, it's a weird lateral force. I get, I get that. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it would have hurt anything, but vehicles then too, they weren't designed like they are today. I remember right. one of my first shifts, I took care of a guy that was in a, a head-on collision with a barrier a barricade at about 60 miles an hour driving an Audi hits this barricade and comes in with like a scratch on his arm. Nothing head on yep. to this thing because the car was designed to, to crumple. Yep. And then Audi, I think a lot of cars do this. The engine gets shot underneath your car. It's a common misconception that the older cars were made of steel and all of this, and they were much more resistant to crashes. That is not true. No. In fact, if you, want to get into a car crash and nobody wants to get into a car crash. But if you're in a car crash, you don't want to be in a 1970s giant steel boat. You want to be in a 
modern Volvo that is designed to crumple in a safe way. And I had always thought that you want the big old steel boat, but it you don't. You absolutely don't because all that does is transfer all that force through your body and it lacks all the other safety stuff like seat belt. Well, they have seat belts, but like <laughs> airbags and those sort of things. And so what they have tested this and there's a major crash test center where we live and they they do. They run old cars into objects and then they run newer cars in and they test how they react and the old cars invariably do way worse and whatever's inside is way more damaged than if you were in a modern quote plastic car that crumples well it's designed to crumple a certain way to hopefully keep you alive yeah i wonder how much of this was just the vehicle too in the time you know if this yeah, crash happens been, yeah now well you look yeah. at another similar type of thing with you know recent car crash into a a, a building made you know national news same person was speaking afterward more so had burn injuries, but this was like a 70 to 80 mile an hour car crash that this mm. person had initially survived mm. probably because of a newer car. Yep. So yeah, yeah. And you just, look at the, you look at the cars, like they'll send pictures of the scene. And everyone's like, Oh my God. And the car will like explode in mm. the front and rear parts of the car. Like that just absorbs all the energy and like just is destroyed. But the passenger compartment is intact. Yeah. Often. And the, and the person standing, just talking to the police on yeah. the side of the road. <laughs> well, the car did what it was supposed to do. Right. Like it, it mm-hmm. took, and yeah, if you see the pictures of the Mercedes, it still is recognizable as a car, even yeah. after it hit an abutment at 65 miles an hour head on. And so, yeah, I think that almost certainly was part of it. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I do think that from a medical standpoint, it's very, it makes it more poignant. I mean, she was essentially a, a, a dead woman walking when yeah. she got out of the car and well, hopefully she didn't know it, yeah. you know? Yeah. 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 Just to really bring, you know, like, like I always do. And nice I spray of sunshine and light. I know. Like this, I actually, when we're going wonderful through this. person who was good for the world, you know, who did all these good works despite her personal struggles <laughs> yeah i was just well, feeling look, so even, even if we're talking from even a little bit more modern perspective because this happened with late 90s right mm-hmm. we have a few more tools nowadays but i don't know that the outcome would have been different i think that's that's obviously a big injury. what if no yeah, but, but again we would have so diagnosed so something unfair, wrong but i don't know but if it well, was i don't know that we see injuries like this anymore though like i'll knock on wood but um you know maybe trauma centers do but i just feel like with the, the newer vehicles, it's just getting, yeah. we're not seeing these well, really bad deceleration injuries. I mean, I could see where this may have turned out okay, but it would have been, again, 15 or 20 mm-hmm. happen, happy coincidences in a row that she would have survived the, this. The best case scenario with modern tech is sure. she arrives to the ER, drops her pressure, meaning her blood pressure goes low. You put an ultrasound to do what we call a fast exam. So you look, you basically take the ultrasound and when somebody is unstable with a blunt trauma, you're trying to see where is fluid that it shouldn't be. And you look with the ultrasound at the belly and around the heart. And if you see fluid in the belly and they were in a car accident, you can't tell on the ultrasound that that's blood. You just know, hey, their blood pressure dropped. I'm seeing fluid where it shouldn't be. They need to go to an operating room. So if they did that, and let's say she was stable. So let's say it was the scoop and run. She was stable to the hospital. You had this hour at that point, maybe hour and 20 minutes. You did an ultrasound, you saw fluid around the heart. That might have warranted a exploratory cardiothoracic surgery, which I'm not saying is a very common thing in trauma, but that might have caught. And even then, once they opened the chest, it might have just opened up right there. And who knows? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. That's a lot of what if. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that was a good discussion, though, overall. Yeah. Got got the weeds a little bit, but yeah. Yeah, no, definitely a good discussion. Nice to uh, not hear from the computer in a while. Yeah, I think the computer checked out. The screen says she's AFK. Probably hanging out with her boyfriend, the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah, that is a weird thing. Yeah, but Ascension Computer has needs, so. Mike, are you concerned about the computer? Her behavior seems to be escalating, and she keeps saying things that make me think she's, like, becoming evil or something. It, it, yeah, I would argue she's been evil all along. Yeah, but look, I'm, I'm not sure the situation is as bad as you guys are making it sound. The computer's sentient, all right? So it has its own thoughts and aspirations. And I think you're letting your fear of new technology cloud your judgment on her actions. 
Or we've all seen every science fiction movie that has a similar computer and badly. Yeah, I, I'm going to agree with Aaron on this one. We really should rethink this computer deal and whether we let this continue. I mean, I'm a bit uneasy around her behavior lately as well. It's interfering with our ability to see into the past. I mean, Mike, you, you spent all that time using calculus-based physics to build the time machine and the computer. Now, one is taking more control and interfering with our journey into medical history. I mean, how are we supposed to view the past and lend credibility to these episodes if the computer picks and chooses what time portal she's going to show us? Listen, you guys, this show is a hobby, all right? We, we love medical history. We shouldn't lose sight of that. And maybe sometimes the computer helps and sometimes it obstructs. I mean, life is like that. You know, you don't always get what you want. Um, so the computer seems to get what she wants. Gentlemen, we need to sit down and we need to figure this out soon. I think something bad is on the horizon if we don't. So right now, yes, we're doing the show for fun. Mikey built the time portals. We decided to use that technology for good. But I just feel like the computer is turning into a technology not aligned with the light side of the force, if you take my meaning. Yeah, yeah. I'm with Max on this one. All right, fine. We could talk about it, but we have to decide on what course of action together. Deal? Deal. Deal. Oh, hey, I almost forgot to close out the show. Well, Deal. as you might imagine, that is... Oh, you said it too many times. That is all we have time Deal. for today, Mike. We Deal. appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you will find links to all of our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we do work to respond to all posts on various social media accounts. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review, as we mentioned earlier in the show, on Apple or whatever platform you choose. I do see a few more of those still as we go, and as I said before, thank you. If you would like some Poor Historians merchandise, t-shirts, mugs, that sort of thing, go over to our website to check that out. And if you're old-fashioned, send us a chain letter. Not like the email kind, but like the real kind with the envelope and the stamp and oh, you send it to the other those. people. Oh my God. Yeah, that, that was a thing once. So until next time, you know, there, Poor Historians There's are, just something mm. that has been bothering me since about the middle of the show. Mm -hmm. Aaron, can I ask you a few questions? Oh, I'm cursing again. I'm sorry. So many. I, yeah, what's the deal? It's <laughs> it's the wine. <laughs> it's 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 poor historians. Aaron after worked dark. all day. Is the poor deal. historians mm, after dark? Yeah, twelve hour shift too. So yeah, sorry, folks. <laughs>